Hi, welcome to Your Health with Dr. Christie. My name is Dr. Christy Reisinger, and today on Your Health, we're going to talk about COVID-19. There's a lot of misconceptions out there, and I'm here to clear some of those up. The first question that I had personally was, where did they get the name COVID-19? Well, it comes from Corona virus disease that started in Wuhan, China in 2019, hence the name COVID-19. As we all know by now, the disease started in Wuhan, China um, in a seafood market that sold live animals. And somehow it jumped from the live animal to the person, which is relatively common. We see that with other viruses as well. And then once one or two people got infected, then it was person to person transmission. I wanna just remind everybody that the main mode of transmission is respiratory droplets. That means when a person coughs, when a person sneezes, or even when they talk, they're emitting respiratory droplets. And these droplets land on surfaces or they're directly enter your eyes, your nose, your mouth when you're talking to that other person. When these respiratory droplets land on surfaces, then you touch those surfaces and unknown to you, you then touch your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and that's how the virus is spread to you. A lot of people say, I don't ever touch my face. That's not true. You touch your face so many times during the hour and you just don't even realize it. So it's easily contracted and easily transmissible from one person to the next. The estimated incubation time after exposure is about four to five days, but it can last or can occur from two to seven days. So after you've had that exposure, two days after the exposure, up to seven days after the exposure, but usually four to five days after exposure, you'll start to have symptoms if you've contracted it. Most people have mild symptoms. Most meaning 80% of the people that are exposed or contract the virus have very, very mild symptoms. 99% of people that have this illness get fever. It can be a mild fever. 99 degrees or higher. But 99% of people with COVID-19 have a fever. Other people, 70% have fatigue, 59% have cough, 35% have body aches. 15% of the people that get COVID-19 start to have severe symptoms, such as hypoxia, which means a low oxygen saturation. You know the little pulse oximeters that they put on your fingers when you're in the, in the doctor's office, that's a pulse ox. So if that number is lower than 99%, that's not normal. And so hypoxia is a low pulse ox number. Also, uh, you may, the, the persons with severe disease also start to have greater than 50% lung involvement. That means they'll start to have infiltrates and they're all types, all kinds of different infil infiltrates, but if greater than 50% of the lung is involved, that's really concerning. And that means they have severe disease. And then there's that critical 5%. These are patients that progress onto respiratory failure, requiring intubation. Intubation is when you're connected to mechanical ventilation, a tube is placed on your throat, you're sedated, and you're collect, uh, connected to a life support machine. It's really a big deal. Other symptoms that can happen when you have critical disease is that your organs may start to fail. You may go into something called sepsis where your blood pressure gets really low. And we've been seeing some interesting cardiovascular deaths related possibly to vi viral car dilated cardiomyopathy, which is when the, the, the heart gets really enlarged because of the virus. And I don't know much about that quite yet. I think we're still learning a lot about it. The most severe cases incur in patients that are old meaning that they're older than 65, and especially if they're older than 80. When you hear about those deaths on television, take note of the age. Most of them are quite a bit older than you or I, you know, in their late 80s. Patients that have comorbidities, meaning have other illnesses like cardiovascular disease. So if you've ever had a heart attack or a stroke, if you have diabetes, especially if it's uncontrolled, if you have any sort of lung disease like COPD or emphysema, or if you smoke, or if you have high blood pressure, or if you're currently being treated for cancer or have had cancer and, an, and are currently on immunosuppressants like prednisone or other prednisone-like medications, those are the patients that tend to have more severe disease. 
for those that have severe disease, here's the timeline of what we're seeing. Shortness of breath usually occurs at about five to six days. Admission to the hospital usually occurs at about seven to eight days. An ICU admission and intubation usually occurs at about 10 days, but the progression to respiratory failure can be really rapid and quick, which is concerning. A, an early warning sign for severe and critical disease is something called hypoxia, which is what I mentioned, a low O2 saturation, but you may not have much many symptoms, but that is something that your doctor should be aware about and take note of, and you should be in daily communication with him or her if you're found to have hypoxia, but you're not having other symptoms. Hypoxia, once again, is a low, to, low oxygen saturation. The most interesting thing about this virus is that the viral shedding can occur before symptoms even develop. They begin to decrease five days after exposure, but they can last up to 10 days. So people that, don't, that have very mild symptoms are actively <laughs> shedding this disease and giving it to other people. A really great bit of information about this, uh, about COVID-19 is that children are greatly spared from these dev de devastating effects from COVID-19. We're just not seeing very many deaths in children and I'm so thankful for that. Here are just my personal opinions about some things that should and shouldn't be done for patients that are concerned about COVID-19. The first thing is really you don't need any blood work unless you're hospitalized. We just don't, the labs aren't gonna help determine one way or the other. They're not that helpful. The white blood cell count, which often determines whether someone has an infection or not, can be high or can be low. So at the end of the day, I just don't think you should be asking your doctor to, ha to have blood drawn. The other thing is don't wear a mask if you don't have a cough or if you don't have symptoms. You'll touch your face more and then those that really need to have masks won't be able to get them. You should wear a mask if you have a cough or if you're caring for someone that you're concerned may have COVID-19 or if that person has a cough. My next big bone of contention is who should be tested? Really, I think only patients that are older with a fever of 99 degrees or higher. And they should be tested both for influenza and COVID-19. If you're young and otherwise healthy, don't go get tested right now. It, it's really complicated and you're slowing down the system and you're burdening a system that just doesn't need to be burdened right now. However, if you're older or if you have other diseases like the ones I mentioned and you have a fever of 99 degrees or higher, you should go get tested. Well, where do you go? That's we're still working a lot of those details out, but call your doctor or your primary care physician or provider. They have information about where to send you. There are drive through clinics being set up in cities all over the United States, and some testing is actually being done through the city health department. The treatment is really not with antivirals. There have not been, we have not found an antiviral that's been effective against COVID-19. So there's not a prescription medication that's been shown to be effective. Things like uh, medications that lower fever, like Tylenol, have been shown to be helpful. Medications that help suppress your cough can be great just to provide comfort. The, be the most important thing is that if you, if you have a fever and a cough, then you should isolate yourself to prevent transmission to someone else, especially the older population in the United States. You should stay in contact with your doctor over the phone and try to decide if you're someone that may need to go to the emergency room. If you decide that you do need to go to the emergency room because you're experiencing shortness of breath or that dyspnea that I talked about, it's so important to call them before you go and call your doctor too to make them aware. How long should you isolate yourself after you have these symptoms? Remember, I'm not advising that everyone get checked for COVID-19, so you may not be sure that you've had it or not. But if you have a fever and a cough um, and fatigue, then we can probably assume that you have COVID-19 or influenza. And I would say that you should isolate yourself 100% um, for as long as you do not have fever 
for 72 hours on no medications. So you can't be taking medications to lower your fever and go out. That, that, that's not the same as being fever free without medications for 72 hours. Interestingly enough, in the United Kingdom, they're recommending that people stay completely isolated seven days after the start of their symptoms. And that's for milder cases, of course. As always, I think one of the most reputable websites for up-to-date information is cdc.gov. There's a lot of misinformation out there and I wanna help reassure rather than continue to cause um, irrationality and increased fear. So at the end of the day, one thing that I want everyone to take home is that if you have a fever, a mild fever, a cough and fatigue, you may have COVID-19. But before you rush out to go get tested, really think about whether you're in a high risk category or not. If you're not in a high risk category, I would say hold off going to get tested for now. That may change as testing availability increases, but for now, leave the test to the older adults and the people that have immunosuppression and comorbid conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, and the other things that I mentioned. Stay safe out there. Remember to wash your hands for 20 seconds. That's really important. And one of the main ways that we can prevent transmission from one person to the next. And when you wash your hands, be sure to rub your hands together because it's the friction that takes the virus off your hands. If you don't have access to soap and water, an alcohol-based anti-infectant like that has 60% alcohol or more um, are great as well, but you need to let them dry on your hands while you're rubbing them together and don't wipe your hands on something else to, to take the alcohol uh, disinfectant off. If you're unable to find an alcohol disinfectant, there are lots of resources online about how to make your own. Thanks for joining me.